Caribbean semester presentation. We are honored to have Dr. Arad Gigi, an expert in Caribbean history uh, from the University of Southern Mississippi. There aren't that many historians who specialize in Caribbean history, and we were fortunate to find one fairly close by in Mississippi. Dr. Gigi's work explores French imperialism and colonization in the region in the 17th and 18th centuries. He is currently working on a book that explores the history of imperial military architecture in the French Caribbean colonies. He looks at the construction and maintenance of colonial fortifications as well as the supporting infrastructure, such as roads, harbors, and hospitals. His research sheds new light on the formation and evolution of colonial state and society, as well as on the history of labor dynamics, slavery, race, and scientific inquiry in the early modern Caribbean. Dr. Gigi has a PhD in history from Florida State University and a Master of Arts in History from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is fluent in Hebrew, English, and French, and he has reading knowledge of Spanish. But well, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gigi to the podium. Thank you so much, Chad. Forts are just as exciting as pirates. I know that you don't believe me, and I'm probably wrong about it, but that's what I think. Uh, thank you again, Chad, and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, opportunity for me to talk about uh, my favorite fort. I know that you may be thinking, well, I'm joking, but everyone needs to have a favorite fort. That's my favorite fort. Is everything good? Great. Uh, the fort that you see here in the background is Fort Saint Louis in Martinique for the France. And let's get a little bit of uh, orientation. So these are the Caribbean. Uh, when we usually think about the Caribbean, we think about Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica is here roughly, uh, Puerto Rico. But there is this string of lesser Antilles colonies. In the middle of them is the French island of Martinique. Still is a French territory, so it's still a French department, just like the island here uh, to its north, Guadeloupe. And that's how you have hurricanes hitting Europe, because hurricanes come here, and these are still European territories. And that's a weird joke. Uh, so for the France, uh, for Saint Louis, as you can see here, and you can see the Navy ship here today, still serves as a base of operation for the French Navy in the Caribbean, mostly engaging in uh, policing of uh, drug trafficking in the Caribbean. Uh, and you can see the Navy ship here. Uh, but it was originally built since the 17th century and into the 18th century as the epicenter of the French Empire and the French Imperial Apparatus in the Caribbean. This became the most important, strategically speaking, politically speaking, geopolitically speaking, the most important possession that the French had uh, in the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that's why they built this enormous fort. But this fort is not unique. And indeed, the European monarchies uh, who had expanded and built their empires in the Atlantic Ocean centered in the Caribbean built similarly monumental fortifications. And we see these large, and these are enormous ones, uh, fortifications dotting the shores of the Atlantic, of the Caribbean islands and the peripheries of the Caribbean. And we can see other examples from for the Grey in Guadeloupe's Bastille. And you can see here an aerial view of this. This is enormous. This is like huge. It's like you can walk an hour from one side to another side. Uh, but also, not only the French, like the Spanish, with Castillo de Moro in Havana, Cuba. You can see similarly monumental fortifications in Cartagena. And why not talk about Florida? Might be out in Florida. So if you've ever been to San Augustine in Florida, or if you've ever went to Puerto Rico, to San Juan, those huge forts, you may have a sense of the grandness of these structures. 
the construction and maintenance, I forgot my water of course, uh, the construction and maintenance of fortifications were some of the most ambitious endeavors an early modern empire could undertake. First of all, they required financial investment, enormous financial investment. So big at some point that it required the state to develop new fiscal tools, what historians have called the fiscal military state in the colonial context, to be able to finance them. They required extensive logistics networks. All of these forts that you see, these huge forts that you see in the images, most of the materials do not come from the Caribbean. Most of these materials don't even exist in the Caribbean. So stones and rocks and bricks oftentimes come from Europe. Wood come from North America. Salt beef to feed the laborers come usually from Ireland. And of course this necessitates developing extensive transatlantic, transoceanic logistics networks. Labor, both working hands, unskilled labor so-called, people to dig, carry stones and carry materials, which is oftentimes performed by uh, slaves, but also by soldiers and servants, as well as skilled labor, artisans, craftsmen, like stone cutters and uh, masons and carpenters and joint workers and metallurgists and miners. And scientific inquiry. The Europeans come to these territories, they know nothing about them. They don't know about hurricanes yet. They did not, they, they were not born in Florida, so they have nothing, they have no you know, recollection of growing up with hurricanes. They come to these new territories and they need to learn about new structures and new uh, materials and the new geography and the new environment. And there is this fun quote that I have from the 1680s in Grenada where the governor general of the island sends a letter to the minister above him and is like explaining to himself, hey, dude, seriously, we build them properly, but everything that we build here uh, falls apart pretty quickly because of the rains. At first, the Europeans thought, okay, let's be cheap and use earthworks. That didn't quite work with the hurricanes and the tropical rains. So then they started to build with stone and rock. Uh, they needed to uh, undertake uh, scientific inquiries to understand, okay, what kind of rocks do we, can we get from the Caribbean and how can we use them? So there was a lot uh, to it. And of course, all of these monarchies, all of these empires in France, in England, Spain, were in Europe. And Europe is quite far away. Now today it takes about 10, 12 hours flight from Paris to Martinique, uh, but in the 18th century it took about eight weeks, give or take, on a ship. So the European centers, the imperial centers are far away and they needed to establish both royal systems and of administration in the colonies as well as to establish working relations with the local elite, read planters. Uh, and these planters oftentimes, as we will see, uh, they were instrumental, uh, this relationship was instrumental because these planters provided the slaves that built those fortifications. So when we look at forts, we may think, huh, that's boring, I want to go to sleep. It's a stone structure. Yes, it's big, but who cares about it? It's old and it's big. But then when you start thinking about it a little bit more, you're like, oh, that's impressive. And then when you keep on thinking about it, you're saying, oh, wait, when we study forts, we really start to unravel what does it mean to have an empire? What does it mean to have colonial societies? And how these colonial societies in the Caribbean had where did they originate and how did they evolve and function with time and how the colonial state functioned and evolved because it, it really unearthed almost everything related to European imperialism and colonization yeah, in the Atlantic world, mostly in the Caribbean. So when we look at the map of the European empires in the Atlantic world, we have the Portuguese here, 
chopping woods in Brazil. We have the Spanish extracting silver. Uh, and of course, we have the Caribbean here and the British here. The French had an enormous empire, but not really enormous because it was a few acres of snow, as Walter once put it, uh, many acres of snow uh, in Canada. But uh, although the Spanish had this huge territory, uh, the Caribbean were oftentimes the center of European activities, and the Caribbean were the ones that were most heavily fortified, because in the Caribbean, as we will see today, there was this terrible drug that people were growing there, and this terrible drug is known as sugar. And of course, you have here a bit closer map of uh, Europeans in the Caribbean. Cuba is a Spanish colony, San Domingue, a French colony, San Domingo and Puerto Rico. These are the greater Antilles, mostly held by the Spanish, but the rest of them are divided between the English and the French. Before going into details of how you build a fort and why do you build a fort, because that's also a question, why would you build a fort? It seems like, oh, you want to defend things, you can build a fort, but you can also do it in other ways. And why do you build them and where do you build them? Uh, these are important questions, but let's start first, uh, because we're in the Caribbean semester, look at these amazing images from the Caribbean, this wonderful region of the world, where you can find coconut ice cream everywhere you go and many, many ripe and tasteful mangoes and pineapples everywhere. So once COVID ends and you can go and travel again, I highly recommend going to the Caribbean. I highly go to recommending uh, going to the French Caribbean because it combines the two best cuisines and two best places in the world, France and Caribbean. So you can be essentially in France, but with a beach. Anyway, let's talk about what we came to talk about today, French colonization uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and this is another map of the Caribbean. And French colonization starts, and for those of you who have been here an hour ago with pirates, uh, know that French colonization starts in the island of St. Christophe, present day St. Kitts and Nevis, in 1626. And this is the first permanent French settlement in the Caribbean. It doesn't work too well, and about nine years later, the French are establishing a new colonization company to settle and colonize the uh, so-called American islands. This is a map of St. Christophe. And then they continue to expand from there to Martinique. See Martinique here? Which we mentioned earlier with for the France. Guadeloupe, an island that, believe it or not, uh, is said to be resembling a butterfly. So this is usually a butterfly island. And you tell me if you see a butterfly here. I never saw it, but maybe. Uh, it's actually a misleading one because if we look here, there's a river. And this is essentially an archipelago because this part and this part are not united or not connected. Anyway, Guadeloupe, in the lake, 17th century, the French will colonize and get this part of Hispaniola to establish the colony of Saint-Domingue, which will become the most lucrative, the most brutal, the most violent, the largest slave society in the Caribbean in the 18th century. And they also had, we didn't mention here, this island of Grenada here in the bottom. In the long term, what the French were typically looking for in these territories, and not only the French, but the English, and the Dutch, and the Danish, and the uh, Spanish, what they were typically looking for is the, the cultivation and production of lucrative tropical commodities, most notably this horrendous drug, sugarcane. I actually like sugarcane because it produces rum, and I had a rum lecture like last week or so on, uh, and rum is awesome. 
uh, but sugar, the so-called sugar revolution is what drives much of this colonization, drives the soaring volume of transatlantic slave trade in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, and it's mostly sugar, you can see some images of sugar cane cultivation. And when we talk about the so-called sugar revolution, uh, spoiler alert, or <laughs> for those of you who have been here an hour ago, this is, looks familiar, we see the explosion. And this is Barbados, the center of the sugar revolution. We see the explosion in sugar cane cultivation, uh, and we see all of these are plantations. So suddenly within a couple of decades, uh, all of the Barbados shore was dotted with sugarcane plantations where uh, in growing numbers of enslaved Africans were toiling the land to cultivate and produce that sugar. Uh, but sugar was not the only thing that was grown in the Caribbean. It actually, the, the first crops were typically tobacco. And we can see here on the left, one of the first images of tobacco. And uh, on the right, you can see image of Africans cultivating tobacco uh, from the 17th century. What happens uh, in the mid 17th century is that Virginians are starting to grow tobacco and then Caribbean tobacco prices plummet. And then the Caribbean planters are like, uh oh, what do we do? We are in debt. We took so much credit to grow tobacco and the prices plummeted. And then Dutch folks come to them and say, you know what, you can grow sugar. You can grow sugar, sugar cane, cultivate it, and if you grow sugar cane, we'll buy it from you. So they start producing sugar, and that's how sugar cane, you know, sugar revolution starts. Uh, so sugar, tobacco are really important for Caribbean history, uh, as well as the most important drink in world history, coffee. And these are the coffee beans. Still, this is an image from Guadeloupe today. Yeah, still a place where uh, sugar, uh, coffee is being uh, grown and processed, and indigo which is this plant that if you process it, uses to dye and color textiles. So for the textile industry, uh, it's being usually produced in small uh, quantities and very expensive and very important kind of a luxurious product, but also one of these uh, industries of the Caribbean, so-called. Okay, so in the 17th century, the Europeans, as we said, the French were starting to conquer these islands, establish colonies. All of these colonies are a failure in the first couple of decades, up until 1661. What happens in 1661, you wonder? I will tell you. Louis XIV rises, or rides, and let's, let's do it again, because I'm very proud of this. Stupid thing I've made here, or this silliness. Thank you. Yeah, the appreciation. Uh, no other king has sported red heels better than Louis XIV. As one of my teachers once said, a drug queen, even in a very expressive day, won't get out of the house as Louis XIV spots for this picture. Uh, in 1661, Louis XIV rises to the throne, and together with his loyal minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, they were want to do more overseas. Uh, and if up until then, the French colonization efforts were mostly private or semi-private, so the island of Guadeloupe was divided between a few private proprietors who owned it, quote unquote, and the other colonies were handled by these uh, semi-private or private charter companies. What happens after the 1660s is that the French are like, okay, let's start to do something more serious here. Uh, and the Crown starts to take things into their own hands and decide to direct colonial affairs directly, not with mediators such as colonization companies. This is not so easy to do, but they start doing that. And they're doing a number of things in the 1660s. One of them is sending a number of voyages because unfortunately they didn't have Google at the time. So instead of Googling what's going on overseas, they had to actually send ships with engineers and with uh, Navy captains and Navy officers 
to figure out what's going on overseas. You know, what are, uh, what's the geography like? What is the human geography like? Say, what are the most important or what, what's going on over there? And these voyages of you know, the 1660s all reached the same conclusion with which we started. And they pinpoint this place, which back then was nothing. There was nothing on it. And there was no city here, not, almost nothing in this area. They pinpoint this area, which was then known as the Coup de Sac Royale, Coup de Sac, a bay essentially, a royal harbor, if you will. They decide or designate this one, they identify this place as the most strategically valuable possession that the French have in the Caribbean. And they identify this place as where the center of the French Empire should be structured. So already in the 1660s, part and parcel of expanding royal authority from Europe to the Caribbean was to build fortifications. Fortifications, and this is something that I continue to argue, are not merely military instruments. They are not merely used for defensive instruments or for defensive purposes, but also because fortifications serve to assert royal authority. They are the material element of the state, and scholars have shown that architecture and how with architecture the state structure the space is really an important thing to how the state uh, establishes authority. So fortifications are really uh, the material element or the part and parcel, parcel of the European Empire. So already from 1669, they start building this amazing fort. Which was supposed to be placed here. Actually, it was supposed to be placed here in the beginning, but we'll talk about it in a second. And after about a decade of building up this fort, they figured out, okay, we did kind of fine on that one. Let's expand to fortify the other islands, San Cristobal, Guadeloupe, and Grenada. So this is a Google image, map image of of Martinique. Today, this place, Fort Royal, is known as Fort de France. You see? During the French, so this was used to be Fort, uh, Fort Royal. During the French Revolution, it was renamed Fort de la République. And then, after <laughs> wars, it became Fort de France. And this is the small peninsula. So the peninsula that you see here, this kind of tongue of land, it's this. And this, ladies and gentlemen, they decided it would be the center of the French activities, the French Empire, and they start building a fort there, and they decided here they will build a city. You see here this, I don't know if you can see the green square, but this is what they decided would be a new city, a new town, which will be the, capital, the administrative capital of the French Empire in the Caribbean. Why would you do that to yourself? Not to yourself, but why did he decide about this place in our next segment? What constituted strategically important location? Now, if you've heard, I'm, I used to be living in Florida for a while, so I really like maps like this one, because <laughs> hurricanes. <laughs> but uh, in more seriousness, uh, we need, when we look at the 18th century, first of all, we need to remember that this is the age of sail. And that wind currents and wind regimes and sea currents shape the distribution of settlement, shape where people settle, shape what constitutes strategically valuable place because it is not easy. You cannot really just, you know, take an airplane and go from one place to another. Or just sail straight from one place to another. You need to take into, to account, into account the wind and the sea current. And this really determined the spatial distrib distribution of European colonization. So what do we see here in this weird map, which is really weird, I know it is. Uh, these are wind currents. Okay, so you have 
uh, first of all, you have ocean current and you have the prevailing wind. Okay, so these are prevailing winds. And when Europeans start exploring the Atlantic Ocean, one of the first impediments that they need to overcome was the need to be able to sail against the wind, what's called against the wind. And as you can see, uh, if you need to sail from Europe to the Caribbean, you're sailing against the wind. And this was the first major challenge for Europeans to actually explore overseas uh, routes. And you can see that most of the trade and the communication and the networks over in the Atlantic Ocean into the Caribbean are based on these sea currents. And these winds also mean that because you're sailing, you cannot just park your ship wherever you want. You need a harbor. And for the harbor, there are not many of them. Each Caribbean island had several harbors, some good, some bad. And this is really where we're getting to understand what or why did Europeans settle in some places, not in others. So take for example, the island of Martinique, okay? Martinique had about eight ports, eight harbors, eight good sacks. Four on this side and four on that side. Now, here, the Atlantic Ocean. Winds, strong winds, high waves, difficult sailing conditions. No one likes to sail in the Atlantic Ocean. Here are mountains. And here is the Caribbean Sea, much nicer. So uh, all of these are quite rough ports. So we're ditching them. Okay, so we're left with these four ports. And this is St. Pierre, and this is Fort And then what determines is how easy is it to get in and out of the port, and how easy to be able to defend that port. And if you look at Martinique, at, at Fort which I mentioned, which is the center, this was considered to be the location that has it all and worth of fortifying and worth of becoming the center of French imperialism because it had everything. It was on the Caribbean side, it had an hinterland that you can uh, cultivate, you can build a city, uh, it was easy to get in and out of the port and because of this tongue of land and the port is here, so this is the Caribbean Sea, here. So you can get you know, ships to go into here, uh, it was considered to be relatively easy to defend. So for the French, they like, found a jackpot. This is a large, fertile island. We can easily build a fort there. We can easily build a fortified city there. And they started building a fort and they started building a city. So this is what's important for where do you actually build a fort? Why do you build a fort there? Because you want these strategically important locations and there are not many of them. San Juan in Puerto Rico is one of those. Havana in Cuba is one of those places. Foya in Martinique is one of these places. There are not many of them that are so good in terms of how you can protect ships in the harbor, how can you protect the ships from the elements, from tropical storms, how you can defend them against enemies that are also on these maritime trade routes that we saw are determined by seas, sea currents and wind regimes uh, and where you can have a hinterland that can sustain the fort during a siege in case need. So this is what constitutes a really, this is where you want to build a fort. Okay, if you have all of this, you're like, here, that's what I want. Here I'm gonna fortify it. But that's the easy part, to define where you want to build a fort. Now you actually need to build it.
So we mentioned all of these elements. I want to talk a little bit about more, especially about labor. Because how do you build forts? This image is from Martinique, a place called Chateau de Bouc, which was a plantation. Today it is still preserved as kind of a national monument, so they still keep it in place. These are the remains of a plantation. This used to be the plantation house. Here used to be work around it here. Uh, and South Africans used to cultivate sugarcane, which was then sold to, uh, to Europe. And why I like this image is because where the humans are still maintaining order, then they clear the land. But if you don't have humans here, the jungle takes over. And when Europeans came, the first thing that they needed to do, if you want to grow anything or if you want to build a fort, was to clear the land. Unfortunately, you don't have any heavy machinery. And this is a really hard work to clear the jungle. And that's only the first stage. After clearing the land, oftentimes you need to dig. Oftentimes they need to bring materials from someplace else. And eventually you have those enormous fortifications that we saw uh, in the beginning. But this is a very uh, difficult, arduous process. Bringing from something that's a jungle with hands, with very little machinery uh, to build these monumental fortifications. So you need to clear the land, you need to dig, you need to bring the materials, and then you need to actually do the construction, and you need a lot of labor for that. And where do you get the labor for that? Labor costs money, labor, you need to mobilize it and marshal it from somewhere. Uh, the colonies uh, typically don't have you know, swarms of laborers to start working there for you for free or just to do the work for money. And, and what the French are doing is they are loaning or temporarily requisitioning slaves from local plantation owners. So if you're a plantation owner, you have 20 slaves working for you in 1680, cultivating tobacco or cultivating sugarcane. You may be sending two of them for two months to work in Fort, in Fort Royal on building the fort. And then they will be returned to you. Most of the labor to build French fortifications in general, to build fortifications in the Caribbean, uh, came from uh, slaves, from uh, plantation slaves that were temporarily requisitioned. Uh, the Spanish, did something a little bit different. The Spanish just purchased hundreds and thousands of slaves to do the work for them, and then they sold them in the economies. Uh, the French would not purchase the slaves. Uh, they typically requisitioned them, which of course meant that they needed to have good relationship with the planters because there wasn't really a system to force the planters to give you the slaves. So when you talk about the need to maintain relationship with the local elites, that's exactly where it goes because these planters are providing you with the slaves. Why did they do it? First of all, because they feel some sense of loyalty to the crown. And second, because it serves their interests. They want military infrastructure to be built. Why do they want military infrastructure to be built? Because it protects them. Pirates. No one wants the pirates to raid them. If you have a fort, your pirates are not going to raid you. So uh, there is an interest for the colonies to collaborate with the crown and build those fortifications. But together with slaves, uh, oftentimes many soldiers have been working on the construction of fortifications, so that, and servants as well. And none of these systems was reliable. These are one of these documents that historians like get to the archives and find one of those kinds. They're like, <gasps> yes, so excited, you know, like Archimedes with Eureka. Like, oh, this is so amazing because this is the one of its kind. I never saw something like that again. Uh, this is from each district, each uh, militia company, each 
quarter essentially in Martinique from June 1681, saying, uh, dividing it quarter by quarter, so this week by the district, uh, who is giving how many slaves for the construction of fortification? So thi and this depends on how many slaves you own. Uh, so this person gives two, this one sends one, this one sends two, this one sends five, and so on. And eventually, there are 34 slaves uh, mobilized from this district. Uh, and we're talking about hundreds of slaves eventually in a colony where the largest plantations, and we're talking about a handful of plantations in the late 17th century, uh, having more than 60 slaves, uh, the state was able to mobilize hundreds of slaves at any one time to build fortifications. And these are enormously large workforces, which of course they needed to be fed and to be, you know, uh, make sure that their uh, diseases are not spreading and so on. So on the one hand, using the COVID, the system of requisitioning slaves, it's awesome, it's cheap. The slave, we are getting the slave for free, we don't do much, it's like nice. But actually it's fraught with problem. Uh, many of the colonies don't like to actually give their slaves, surprise, they don't like to give their property, they don't like to pay taxes, and this is like a tax. Uh, but also sometimes there are wars. Uh, and this is one example from uh, one of these wars, at the time of war, no one wants to give their slaves because they don't have surplus, they don't have the access to give their slaves. Uh, and we see that the reliance on the system of requisitioning really limits the ability of the French crown uh, to effectively mobilize labor. So this is really slows down the construction of fortification. And eventually, after the Seven Years' War, the French are like, ah, we had enough of that. We're no longer going to use slaves. We're going to use soldiers, and we're going to send battalions and battalions of soldiers to the Caribbean to build fortifications. And this is really nice, but also fails. And uh, one of the greatest impediments for the French or for any empire to build fortifications was that they never had enough labor because it's such a labor onerous uh, endeavor or enterprise to do that. You don't only need slaves or unskilled laborers, you also need skilled laborers, stone cutters. And these are images from uh, Guadeloupe that I've taken, and you can see that you need stone cutters, and all of these are uh, rocks that are cut by uh, stone cutters, and you need many artisans, and uh, you can see here another image from Fort and Saint Charles in Guadeloupe. Uh, Think about how many rocks you need to build those forts, those structures. So these are modern addition to them, uh, but the originals are here, the origins are here. And this is the original. Uh, you need many, many stone cutters, and of course there's the logistics issue of that, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, but stone cutters, masons, and carpenters especially were always needed, and the French crown is using all sorts of ways, whatever creative way they can find to mobilize skilled labor, they will do that, including uh, training slaves to do skilled work, uh, including higher contracting in France indentured servants, uh, skilled, skilled artisans like craftsmen, uh, like uh, stone cutters and masons and so on and sign them as indentured servants to work in the colonies for a period of three years as indentured servants of the crown to do the work. Uh, so really a series of challenges on how you actually mobilize that uh, and how you overcome or how they overcame uh, the challenges of labor. As I mentioned, the rocks often come, the stones are coming from Europe itself. It sounds crazy, which it is, but it's actually less crazy because ships needed something to stabilize them, so it kind of makes sense to send bricks, but bricks and rocks and so on oftentimes come from Europe. And this is a memoir explaining what kind of cut stone is coming from each area in Normandy and what can we use it for in the colonies. And this is a very long memoir, but you can see, you know, from one comes this kind of 
pieces of rock and this is what we can use them. So this is like a very technical uh, treat is explaining, oh, these are all, these are the kind of uh, rocks that we get from the lab, that we get from Normandy, uh, and this is what we can do with it. Yes, it is crazy, but it shows you something about the extent of the French Empire, its ability to contract skilled artisans in the French mainland, in the hinterland, to become indentured servants to work in the colonies, uh, bringing bricks from Nantes and rocks from Havre all the way, nine weeks sail away from there to the Caribbean, mobilizing hundreds of slaves at a time to work on the construction of fortifications, bringing the salt beef and the cod fish from Newfoundland or from Ireland to feed them. And constantly upscaling the volume of operations because every time there was a war, they were like, oh, wait, we need more, and we need more, and we need more, and constantly uh, upscaling and increasing their operations in the Caribbean. Let me give you a nice example. So for the France, right, for Royale that we mentioned, the first one, at first the, European, the French were like, hey, this is gonna be easy. There's a cliff here. We only need to build something here. We're fortifying it, that will be awesome. We don't need much more than that. But then the Dutch came and landed here. And then they realized, oh, we didn't see that coming. So then they start building more. They started building a rear bastion and more and more and more. And, uh, eventually building more artillery batteries and building more walls and building more structures in the fort itself, but also realizing that this is not enough because, for instance, uh, so here is Fort Royal, uh, and sometimes they're facing invasion from here from a place called Pointe du Neg. Uh, sometimes they face uh, invasion from Casa de la Ville or Mont Atasson, or uh, realizing that Fort Royal is overseen by these two mountains or hills, Tantasson and Garnier, so actually it is low and maybe we need to do something else. And what they start doing is not only fortifying and more and more and more the fort itself, they start building artillery battery on this hill and artillery battery on this place and in this place and then eventually, or also on the other side of the bay, so this is a bay, and they start fortifying this small inlet and eventually, after the Seven Years' War, they realized, you know what, scrape it. For you, we can't defend it. There is this mountain over there. Let's be there an entirely new large fort. And these are the plans, and this is the fort that you see. Still today, the French bases, so you can't go into it. Uh, it was called Mont Garnier, the mountain uh, in the name of Garnier. And the fort was called Fort Bourbon. And if we look at these operations in the 1670s, 1680s, we were looking at a monarchy that was spending 20,000 livres, I think about 20,000 pounds or $20,000 annually on fortifications. In the 1730s, it was talking about hundreds of thousands every year. Uh, the plan to build Mont Garnier was estimated at 11 million. So when we talk about the development, how first of all, the growing investments and the growing need to develop fiscal systems to raise all these funds, but also the labor and logistics and everything just becomes larger and larger. And historians today understand and appreciate that the age of revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, Latin American independence movement, the Haitian Revolution, all were precipitated by crumbling empires. This is where they're crumbling. Why is the French empire, why is the French monarchy in 1789 so broke? because it had spent so much money on its Caribbean colonies. And because Ivan after decided that it needs only to fortify Fort Royal, it actually built more forts uh, in two other locations. And just to give you a sense, so in St. Pierre, uh, the largest city in Martinique, this is what an artillery battery looks like. 
I don't know if you can get a sense, there is this random guy that got into my picture, but he's really good because he gives you some sense of what an artillery battery looks like, and you have the cannons here at the top. You can see some more images of that. Uh, these are the remains of this, but this is just one artillery battery. So think about all of these operations that came, brought together into building these structures, and this is from the top. Uh, it's enormous. It's really, it really is enormous. And then I've been talking so much about Martinique, but it's not only Martinique. So if we look back at this island that looks like a butterfly, which I never saw the butterfly, but that's it. So they start building a fort here, but then realize, wait, we need more forts, and they build two more here, and they build more artillery batteries. And this is the story of the French fortification effort uh, in the Caribbean. First of all, always needing to do more, but also the French forts themselves require so much and reveal so much about the history of colonization. Because when you think about it, it's not only about the forts. It has wide ranging implications on uh, colonial economy. Uh, there are roads uh, that the French are building roads between the different uh, military garrisons in the colonies. Uh, and these roads are important to facilitate trade inside the colonies, but also uh, to cultivate collective identity because people start to get to know each other and be more in touch with one another. Uh, they bring in skilled labor. Uh, they bring in a lot of resources. So these fortifications also both reveal to us something about how an early modern empire, like the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, functioned. What were the challenges that they made, met, but how they overcame them. And how did these colonial societies originated, developed and evolved with time, all are revealed by the history of fortification. And that's it for me today. Thank you. And I think there's a microphone somewhere here. Yes, Chad is with the microphone there. For anyone who wants to. That was so awesome, no one has questions. Uh, those on Zoom, if you want questions, I'm um, with the Q&A open. Zoom questions? No. That makes you sad. So you explained it very well. Oh, thank So historians in recent years started to move away from the notion of these binaries of what is a free and unfree labor. You know, uh, these dichotomies of you're either free or slave, you're either white or black in the early modern uh, societies, into appreciating the early modern uh, Atlantic labor dynamics as much more as the continuums of unfreedoms. So uh, understanding that they are much more complex. Uh, the term has been very pop much popularized by a book by that title, Unfreedom, Freedom, on Colonel Boston by Jared Hardesty from the University of Washington Western or something like this. He's in Washington somewhere. Uh, and if you're interested, yes, there is a book with that title uh, which popularized it, but he's not the only one. There are other historians like Alison Mother from the University of Oregon or Justin Roberts in the Jose University in Canada who are working on this assumption that uh, we need to break away from thinking in these binary dichotomies of you're either free or slave, but to appreciate that there are gradations of servility and gradations of so called unfreedom. When can we expect your book to come out? That's a very good question in the current economy and the uh, academic uh, market. I have no idea. 2021, I'll say. You can say. Uh, I've been talking with editors. Uh, we'll see. We'll see about it. 
If you want to chip in and you want me to open a GoFundMe for a book, you know, that would help. I would not say, you know. You're on Twitter? Of course. What's your Twitter? So, <laughs> let me tell you a story. Uh, my Twitter is Arad J. Gigi uh, at Twitter, and I don't have a middle name. Uh, and if anyone can guess where the J come from, you'd be my hero. And I give you a, a hint the Simpsons. Yes, because there is this entire story about Homer J. Simpson and where did J come from. So when I decided, when I first opened Twitter, I was like, uh, I don't have a middle name, but let's put J like Homer. And that's how I end up being with Arad J. Gigi. I don't have a middle name. No, Israelis sometimes have a middle name, but most of us don't. That's the true story of my Twitter handle. Thank you so much, everyone.